fellow redeemed in the blood of Christ Jesus. A few moments ago in our Holy Gospel lesson, we heard how 4,000 people had gathered around Jesus out in the middle of the wilderness. And out there, our Lord Jesus had compassion upon those people. Because he himself turned to his disciples and he said, If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. Some of them have come from far away. <coughs> and then we hear how our Lord Jesus took some rather small and simple things, just seven loaves of bread and a few small fish, and he performed a great miracle, much like he had done with the similar feeding of the 5,000. He took that tiny amount of food and he used it to feed that giant mass of people. He took something small and insignificant and he turned it into a glorious, filling feast for those people he provided for them out there in that desolate place. Simply because he had compassion on them. Simply because he cared for them and had concern for them. He provided what they needed out there in the wilderness. And dear friends, we find ourselves in a very similar situation. Because we find ourselves currently in the wilderness of this world. Of this sinful, fallen world. It is a desolate place in a spiritual sense. And Jesus recognizes that we are in need. We are in need for something that we don't have, but it is something that our Lord Jesus has. And he wants to freely give it, hand it to you. Today, we want to consider the great gifts that God gives us. And as we consider these great gifts that he gives us here in the wilderness of this fallen world, we want to see that, first of all, they are so often taken for granted. Because there are so many distractions that pop up that try to compete with these gifts. But these are gifts that we must realize are of the greatest worth and value. Let me share with you again a single verse which is drawn from our epistle lesson that will serve as our sermon text this morning. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. And I ask you to please rise as we hear these words in Jesus' name. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray. Heavenly Father, we freely admit before you that we deserve death. We are guilty of sin. We participate in evil. We have been slaves to unrighteousness. But realizing our failings and guilt, we come before you and we trust in the work of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we know and we rejoice in your promise that all who call upon him will be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, this sinful, fallen world that we live in is, in a spiritual sense, a wasteland. It's a wilderness. St. Paul says the whole creation was subjected to futility. The whole creation has been groaning. It was when sin entered the world through Adam that this place, which was a self-proclaimed masterpiece of God. Remember how God said, it is good. But it was then when sin entered this world that the entire world became thrashed. It turned into a total die. Man took this place, which was created holy and perfect by God, and man booted God out of it, setting up in that place where God should have been a new ruler, the ruler of sin. And this wicked tyrant of sin works very hard to try and fool people. He works to try and disillusion you. He brings before you all the sparkly, shiny objects of this world that look so appealing and tempting to you. And sure, they might give you a little rush, they might give you a little excitement, but really in the end, they have no worth or value at all. It's kind of like how you hear the earliest explorers that came to America. They brought with them these little trinkets. Really, it was just worthless junk. But it was junk that the natives here in America had never seen before. 
And so they foolishly ended up trading away some of their most valuable possessions for these worthless pieces of trash. History books will tell you that the natives sold the entire island of Manhattan in New York for something like $24. And dear friends, this is what sin does to us. It takes advantage of us. It cheats us. It rips us off. It takes things that are of no worth or value, and it uses these things to try and entice you and ensnare you. It takes all the fleshly things of this world, and it lies to you. It says, you want this. This will make you happy. Do this, and your life will be fulfilled. This will make everything better. These are, of course, all things that Scripture warns us about. These are the things that the world takes and holds before us and tries to tell us, forget about what God's Word says. These are desirable for you. St. Paul explains this in Galatians 5. He says, The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And yet, in spite of St. Paul's dire words of warning, when he says, I warn you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In spite of these words, sin so frequently wins in the hearts of people. We do these very things that we should not do. So often we give in, we give in to our own selfish, sinful desires and wants. We end up making excuses as to why we do these things. We try to justify ourselves in our own sinful actions. We try to shift the blame off of us and onto other people, or even try to blame God for it. Instead of seeing the error of our way, we so frequently dive deeper and deeper into it. And when this happens, we fall victim to a scam, to the scam of sin. We trade out what God wants for what we want. And when we do this, dear friends, we are submitting ourselves to that wicked king, that evil tyrant of sin. We're giving ourselves up and over to be slaves to him, slaves to sin. <clears throat> there was an old pastor who once illustrated it this way. He said there was a wicked, evil tyrant king who asked one of his subjects to come before him. And he asked him, what is it that you do? And the man replied, I'm a blacksmith. Oh, a blacksmith. Well, I want you to make for me a chain of a certain length. The blacksmith went out and he labored over this for several months. And he came back and he, he, presented, the, he presented that chain before the king. But the king hardly looked at it. He didn't care about it. He didn't give the blacksmith any praise. He said, go and double it. Double its length. So the blacksmith went back out. Another few months he came back. Again, the king didn't even look at it. Double its length again. This went on for a few more times until finally that blacksmith came and the wicked tyrant, that evil king, turned and he commanded his guards, take that chain, bound that man, and throw him into the fiery furnace. How cruel. How wicked. And how true this is also of sin. Sin is that cruel king because it keeps making demands of us. It keeps telling us what to do and what will ultimately become of it. Nothing but death. As we heard in our verse, the wages of sin is death. Sin will never give you fulfillment. Sin is never the answer. All of those shiny, sparkling, appealing things of this world that sin offers you are simply distractions that lead nowhere but to death and suffering. In fact, that's the only thing that sin could ever give you. Death. What a lousy reward that is. You'd rather have death over the gifts that God is offering? The good news, dear friends, is that this wicked king of sin has now been overthrown. He has been defeated. He no longer needs to torment anyone because there's a new king in town. 
No longer is it the king of sin that brings death, but we have the king of righteousness who brings eternal life. It is Jesus. Instead of cruelly exacting work and giving payments that really add up to nothing like, like sin does, our Lord Jesus now comes and he offers his love, he offers his help, his service, and all for free, as a free gift, like our verse said, the free gift of God is eternal life. It all happened when God himself stepped off of his throne on high, and he entered this world that needed his help. He went to war against sin when he took upon himself our own human flesh and blood. When he became our brother, he came in order to live a life of perfect obedience. He lived a life that was free from the tyranny of sin. Never once did he go and commit a sin. He lived a life of righteousness. And yet, dear friends, this is a life that he then willingly gave up as he suffered and died. He experienced the full fury and attack of sin as he hung and died upon the cross. And he took all of those wages of our sin upon himself so that we might have forgiveness. He suffered death for us. That death that we deserve. But then, on the third day, on Easter morning, our Lord Jesus raised the flag of victory. When death was defeated once and for all. The tomb was open. It was empty. Jesus was no longer dead. Instead, he was alive. And that wicked, evil king, that wicked tyrant of sin, was kaput. He's finished, as Jesus proclaimed from the, from the cross. Sin no longer has any real power over you. You don't have to bow your knee to him. You don't have to submit to his wants. He is dead. And in his place is a new king. Really, it's the original king, our Lord Jesus, who doesn't torment you. He doesn't make demands of you, but instead, our new king, our Lord Jesus, is compassionate and loving. He provides for you, and he only seeks your love in return. It's kind of like what happened on June 19, 1865. Two years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, General Gordon Granger rode into the town of Galveston, Texas, and there he read out loud to all of the residents the General Order Number 3, which said this. It said, The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, from the President himself, all slaves are free. Slaves in Texas, for the very first time, learned that they were already free by something that had taken place before. And so it is with you and me and with all people, dear friends. We have already been set free. We have been totally set free from this slavery to sin. Set free by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And that means that we can now walk away from sin. We don't have to give in to him. We are no longer people sitting in darkness. We're no longer children of wrath. The sun has dawned upon us. We are now in Christ Jesus, reconciled to God through the cross, as St. Paul writes. He has come into the desolate wilderness of this fallen, sinful world. And he has provided for us this, this gift of the greatest worth, salvation. And this, dear friends, is a gift that we don't ever want to take for granted. It's a gift that we should never take our eyes off of. No matter how shiny and sparkly or tempting those other distractions might be in this world. Never trade in this gift that God gives us for worthless junk. Instead, we must understand that this gift that we possess is a wonderful thing. And it is a gift, really, that keeps on giving. It's a gift that we can turn to and use again and again. You see, as we trudge through the wilderness and wasteland of this fallen, sinful world, all of those temptations around us, they try to weasel their way back into our hearts. And more often than not, we let them in. And we fall into sin every single day. 
Every single day, the old Adam inside of us, that sinful man, rears itself up and it tries to take us away from our new king. But this is why that gift that Christ has given us is so great. Because he gives it to us again and again every single day. Every day, as scripture says, God's mercies are new. In spite of our sinfulness, God graciously provides us every single day with his forgiveness and with new life. Every single day, he announces to you that your sins are forgiven. He reminds you of the fact that you have been baptized. He has washed you clean. You come and you partake of the sacrament of the altar. You receive Jesus' own body and blood for the forgiveness of all of your sins. We open up the words of scripture and we hear it proclaimed. That all who call upon the name of the Lord, that is all who turn in faith to Christ as their king, will be saved. Once again, our Lord Jesus has taken things that seem to be otherwise small and insignificant, and he turns them into a fulfilling feast that he himself provides for us in this otherwise desolate place. He takes a bit of water that's sprinkled upon your head in baptism. He takes some bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. He takes an old book. And he turns these simple and unassuming things into powerful, precious treasures that bring to you and to me personally that freedom from sin and its death. And it gives us his righteousness and eternal life in heaven. The wages of sin is death. So forget him. We are free from sin. We have a new king who loves us. Who has given and continues to give us that free gift of eternal life. Indeed, what wonderful and great gifts it is, these are, that God gives us. All glory be to him. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together now and sing the offertory. You find it printed on the bottom of page 5 in your bulletins. Amen. 